Oh yeah, Ajay sir, we can begin. We have hundred people in the lobby right now. Yeah, are you are you in? Are we are we on? Yeah, we are on. Yes. Good morning. Welcome to this fifth webinar in our series of leading through the pandemic. Hope all of you are doing very well and keeping safe. During the last five weeks, we have covered various aspects from reaction to reconcile to revival of the industry, and various ideas have been discussed. in our retail industry it is now getting clear that retail won't be the same what we have been experiencing till now and retail associates when i say retail associates people working in the retail industry across the value chain are our real heroes who actually who are who are running the business who bring delight to our customers today we will talk about them and discuss about their new roles in this in this new industry how we see out after the outbreak As you know, we have received some very interesting questions for some of you, and we have used some of them uh, to guide today's session. A little disclaimer that the views expressed in this session are all personal, and using the brand and the companies each individual is representing. Just keep that in mind. So we have a very global panel today uh, with deep insights about the role of people and the retail business. and on top of all this we have a legend from the indian retail industry and some call him father of the retail modern retail in india uh, mr b s nagesh founder of train he doesn't need much introduction there is no one better than him to address the subject his passion to the cause of retail associates is what led him to found train after he retired from his active role in superstop thank you mr nagesh for joining us and it is uh, wonderful to have you and let me now introduce uh, other panelist we have harveen gill founder md hta from london she is one of the most experienced professional especially on fashion retail uh, and and manpower of the industry with a lot of expertise about people in the value chain i remember meeting and hearing her harveen many years ago at a retail leadership summit in bombay and we have been in touch with them thanks harveen for being in touch with since then no problem Let me introduce you to Radhika Vivek, senior partner, Transearch, a global manpower organization working with the retail industry. She is well known to retailers across the country. And now finally, we have Rajiv Nair, CEO of Kaya, a very quiet man, but very thorough with his nuances of his business and personal care. Uh, Rajiv will bring a different aspect to this discussion since he represents a service retail and not really the merchandise retail. So without taking more time let me hand over to Mr Nagesh please write your questions in the chat box all of you are on mute please note that and if we get time uh, Mr Nagesh will will pick up or me I will pick up some questions and we hand over to you I hand over to you Mr Nagesh all all to you thank you thank you Ajay good afternoon ladies and gentlemen it's a privilege and a pleasure to be part of this panel uh, only thing is one correction to Ajay he said i have retired from shop stop Uh, Ajay, there are no retirements in my life. Yeah, uh, I have multiple startups uh, as of today, and I hope none of us ever retire because I think currently the country requires people to be absolutely active. Uh, this this pandemic has brought a lot of changes across the industry, and since we are talking of retail industry, I thought best is to address what's happening across the world. Uh, what we have seen in india and many of you know is not an indian phenomenon this has happened all across the world whether it is uh, one continent or other continent a uh, retail being the last mile of uh, the supply chain and the first mile of the customer has had the maximum amount of impact and the impact has its own multiplier effect basically because if if a retail is not open or the doors of the retail shops are not open or online business is not functioning most of the manufacturers or producers or or suppliers of goods actually cannot supply so actually it is the it is the choke which can actually uh, bring down the whole industry uh, and now it's almost a month or a month plus since the time the lockdown has happened and uh, we are seeing some serious implications uh, there are huge job losses which have happened in the western world whether it is 22 million which has happened in us or millions happening in europe and other parts of the world where the impact has been very very large India, we've had the lockdown in the last six weeks' time, more or less four to five weeks of lockdown and one week of self-lockdown for many of us, uh, because of what we sensed is likely to happen. Yeah, and in this situation, the essentials have worked, and non-essentials have been totally closed. In essentials, also, if you look at it, India has uh, between twelve to fifteen million retailers, 
a large number of kiranas modern retail is just about 13 40% online is about 2% so we can say 85% of the business is still in the traditional hands uh, if you look at kiranas have operated and i think they have been able to uh, ensure that the 130 crores of indians have had their kitchens going live and i think thanks to them uh, the foot soldiers of the retail industry we have survived but the non essentials have been totally closed and even in the the modern retail supermarkets the non essential part of the supermarkets have not worked so therefore the supermarket chains in the modern retail have done well in terms of revenue but are likely to be making losses because the margins on the food and grocery don't make them survive especially because of the kind of rentals and things like that they, they pay on top of it, we've had a lot of labor who are mostly migrant. Uh, the research done by Crane about two years back actually showed that 42% of uh, people working in retail in the top eight to 10 cities are actually migrant workers. And uh, many of them have gone back and therefore we've had shortage of people on the front end. And many a times due to social pressures or they living in containment zones, they have not had people coming into the stores. So retail has been operating on a 40%, 45% manpower. And, and I think this is, this is the current scenario as far as uh, Indian retail is concerned. But because India is on a growth curve, uh, we had an ambition and I'm sure we still have an ambition to be a $5 trillion economy. Every retailer was on a growth curve and therefore almost all the equity that a retailer had has been invested for the future and any debts that they have taken and they're all at one is to one, one is to two is also meant for the future, which means that most of us would not have cash in the balance sheet or will not have cash flows to sustain this for long. So I think there will be struggle for 90% or 95% of the retailers as we go forward. And the struggle is going to become deeper in the next one, two, three months time. So under these scenarios, if you open up the discussion to say what's happening around the globe and what can happen to India, and we keep ourselves a specific topic of retail associates, their role and how the roles will change as we go in the future, for, for, for audience, let me say, here retail associates, we're not talking of only the last mile front end associate, but we're also talking of the supervisory and the managerial role in the stores. And I would request Harveen and Radhika to also speak about the retail associates in the back offices. So at the end of the day, a CEO, a managing director is also a retail associate because we are serving our customers. So with that background, I would like to open up uh, to Harveen uh, with her to give us some opening remarks but I would also like to know what's happening uh, in UK. Uh, on a little lighter side, Indian uh, uh, politicians and many of them are asking, saying we should open up the liquor shops for two reasons. One is that the government can get more excise. And the other reason is that uh, a lot of us probably who are deprived, I think that's the only way to bring our moves back. But I'm told the liquor is doing extremely well in UK, Harvin. And uh, over to you for a perspective on retail, your perspective on the subject, and of course, what's happening to the wine sellers of UK? Uh, thank you, Mr. Nagesh, uh, for that introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. So we're uh, a month into lockdown uh, with the UK. Uh, essential stores are open, so pharmacies and uh, supermarkets, food stores, alcohol stores, and bizarrely now, in some cases, some DIY stores. In March, we had the worst retailing statistics since um, records began. Overall, we were almost 6% down. And there were some huge discrepancies within that. So supermarkets, which is a very mature market in the UK, 10% up as people stockpiled. Uh, fashion took a 35% hit, which was huge, and um, alcohol through off licenses was 35% up. Down um, in the first quarter, just for a couple of weeks in March. So, we're anticipating uh, much worse results in the second quarter. Um, there are a lot of studies that are being undertaken by um, a number of different organizations. McKinsey. McKinsey is free, it's available on Google. Um, have a look at it. It does focus on various geographical territories. The immediate 
impact in terms of retail um, is that um, we are predict predicting uh, 250,000 job losses within retail 2020 in the UK. We had about 85,000 job losses last year and the same number again in 2018, 2018 as automation continues its journey throughout the UK. So we are going through huge change. The, the, the period of COVID-19 is only going to accentuate this. Um, the immediate impact in retail and uh, roles is it's hitting the uh, females the most because obviously there are more females in the front line in stores uh, in retail and also those aged under the age of 25. So that's the immediate impact. But of course, all CEOs out there are working through their plans in terms of the new dawn, the new world, what retail is going to look like post COVID-19, what their operating models need to look like, what their purpose is going to be, what their their talent structure needs to look like, what their structures need to look like. So that new world is going to be determined by their, by the commercial vi visions and reality. Thank you, Irene. Uh, let me go to uh, Rajiv. Uh, she spoke about the impact of uh, this pandemic on women employees. And uh, I think Kaya has a very large number of women employees and you have a very large number of customers, okay? I don't want this question to be answered as the CEO of Kaya, but if you look at the women employees in retail, is there anything specific that the industry can do to ensure that there is continuity of jobs? How do you keep them engaged, especially when they are at home? Anything that you have done, Rajini, which can be a good highlight for the people who are on this webinar? I think uh, overall, if you look at the perspective of women employment in India, I think uh, uh, women are fairly largely underrepresented in retail in India in comparison to what has happened in the West. I believe there is a very large opportunity for women to come into employment in retail because most companies in retail are today talking about an average of 20 to 30 percent women employees, where in large part of the employment is on the front line, especially is male uh, employees. Obviously. From, from a customer facing business perspective, women bring in that extra emotional portion and obviously have a very uh, good edge uh, to men in terms of customer facing roles. And I think we are a good representation of an organization for the last 17 years, which has continuously invested on women employees, understood the challenges of employees and created and built policies over a period of time which are suitable for working women in the organization. We are 95% plus working women in the organization and they are either primary breadwinners or they are uh, they are uh, joining the family in terms of uh, creating uh, you know the household income uh, uh, in, in this so if you look at it i think the biggest uh, input that kaya has really created is continuously invested on scaling up and training women uh, which whether it could be as simple as a, a entry frontline therapist or it could be as skilled as a doctor who works in a clinic like ours. So I think the amount of talent investments that a company like ours has done is something that is lacking in the industry. Secondly, I think uh, the ability to look at women and women's specific problems in terms of working through their, their various life stages is something that uh, India as a country has really not looked at. Very recently, I think there has been some changes in policies, especially around maternity leaves and stuff like that that have happened, which has helped. But companies like ours have put the foot forward almost six to seven years ago and created policies which are towards this. So if you look at it, I think what we have seen is a lot of positivity in the organization despite of this crisis. Uh, I can see people are, uh, are uh, I, I would say as an organization, people are uh, uh, not so frustrated. They are actually anxious and eager to get back to workforce. Uh, they are willing to go that extra mile. Uh, so even today, I would say customer connect in our organization is fantastic because of uh, this gender mix, I would say. And uh, we have seen almost 25 to 30,000 customers contacted in the last one month by our employees sitting at home. 
So while they are participating, they're trying their level best to find ways and means to get back to customers, talk to customers, keep them engaged. And, uh, and overall, I think the mood is fairly positive. Uh, so I think as, an, as, a, as a retail industry, if we invest more on women talent and women uh, employment and also women in management, because one of the other features of our organization is out of a six member Mancom team, we are talking about four members out of six actually being women. So I think not just talking about women at the front end, but women at all levels of the organization is something that we need to be accepting. And retail is a great career for women, and I think uh, more companies should be investing on it. So that's my. Aji, I think I think your discussions have opened up a very good opportunity for retail industry. I mean, migrant workers. If you look at it, the majority of the migrants are men. Okay, so if there are migrant workers going back, then actually the industry should welcome, yeah. train and skill women from the local, and get them back into jobs. Because as much as people are worried about job losses, I'm also seeing job opportunities. But well, suddenly the whole migrant worker will create a vacuum as far as the jobs are concerned or roles are concerned. Yeah, Radhika, uh, if I if I talk to you about the whole job scenario, uh, talk to you about people because you must be meeting people on both the sides. The anxiety that they are happening, uh, the fact that there's word all around saying job losses are there, uh, the fact that they are still on the other side, there are opportunities for jobs. Okay, what are your opening remarks and how do you see the whole sector? As a as retail sector, especially keeping the lens of people and and the HR lens, the people lens. Sure. So thanks, uh, Nagesh. So a couple of things. You know, when this entire crisis started and we all went into lockdown, um, I got into a series of conversations with some of my clients in the retail sector, and uh, some of them, of course, had very common remarks. Um, obviously, because all large format retail has you know uh, has shut down. The only retail that's operational right now is the local Kirana stores and the local traders. The large format organized retail and especially non-essential retail has all shut down. So I heard, you know, terms like it's a bloodbath this year to, you know, uh, businesses down and all of the rest of it. But the, the common understanding here is everybody was scrambling to look at ways to, to sort of last out the next three to six months. Because the understanding is if the lockdown lifts, say, sometime by the end of May or sometime in June, thereafter steps could be taken to try and get back. But they're looking at demand reviving sometime in the, in the, in the uh, you know, in the August, September uh, quarter when there, are, there is festival season in India and typically, uh, you know, retail activity spikes in that period. But if we look at people then, uh, the, the question that comes up is to what extent are organizations able to hold on to people during this lean period and what are the kind of steps that are being taken and i think uh, the most common steps that are being looked at are um, you're looking at staggered timings right now of course everybody is locked up and staying at home but once you know this lockdown lifts um, we're looking at 50 percent uh, staffing in stores and people being uh, you know uh, people being paid for only the number of hours that they work but really looking at steps to retain as many associates as possible uh, because the impact of this is more societal. So while obviously there is a clear business impact, there is an economic impact, I think COVID in this case has had a very large social impact. And it's important for organizations to understand that the societal impact will have a long-term impact on their businesses. So if they can manage people and people resources well, their businesses will in the medium to long term come back to, you know, to, to, well, maybe not where they were originally, but at least they will come back on track. So managing their people and people resources during this period will be very important. And therefore looking at ways to do that, you know, you put some people on furlough, uh, you, know, um, you know, make them work, say only 50% of the time and pay them for that period. But as long as they're able to retain their jobs, um, you know, there is, there is hope to get them back to full-time work at whatever point in time businesses divide. The other thought, which I think McKinsey has suggested in one of its reports, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good suggestion, and, and some um, businesses in some parts of the world, um, I think the food manufacturers in the U.S. have, uh, have, have tried this in the, in the U.S. Midwest, which is creating a kind of talent exchange. Now, um, you know, in India, the retail sector already has some apex bodies like the RAI or the RASCI. Now, these are um, associations where the large retailers are already members. Um, if there could be some visibility on the kind of talent that you feel 
uh, you know, needs to be put on furlough or even, you know, needs to be laid off. There are segments that are hiring, you know, which are growing. E-commerce, for instance, today is seeing a huge upswing. And I don't think consumer behavior will change even post lockdown. People will still be scared to really step out and, um, you know, uh, go shopping in malls, etc. for some time, which means that e-commerce activity is definitely going to go up which e-commerce companies are hiring, online grocery is hiring. The entire uh, ecosystem which supports e-commerce, sectors like logistics, sectors like warehousing, uh, transportation, they will see some amount of hiring. Those could be places uh, where this talent could be, uh, you know, could, could, be, uh, could be moved. Now, if there is some concerted effort made to see how that talent migration could happen, some upskilling and thereafter redeployment of talent could be done. That could be a great way to manage the situation and ensure that we don't have too many associates who lose their jobs. I mean, there will be some job loss in retail. I mean, that's inevitable. But could that be done in a manner that instead of them losing jobs without you know, alternative jobs coming up their way, is there a way in which organizations could work together and look at you know, uh, moving talent from, say, retail to other sectors that are looking at hiring. Today, I think healthcare is hiring. Online pharmacies, uh, today, pharmacy chains are hiring. Uh, the entire e-commerce world is hiring. The entire ecosystem supporting e-commerce is hiring. Everything from packaging to warehousing. I think going forward, once uh, the lockdown is lifted, um, there will be other um, hiring which happens. Logistics will hire. That could be the time we could look at what kind of upskilling could be done and what kind of movement of people could, could be you know, facilitated. And I think uh, organizations like the RAI or the RASCI or even TRAIN for that matter could get involved because uh, you, know, you have um, a lot of involvement from a lot of the large players in the retail sector. And uh, you know, they could be brought together and uh, you know, there could be a more transparent, I mean, it's a need for transparency for me. So Radhika, you're absolutely right. In fact, I must share with uh the audience that RAI uh, in the very initial period when it saw a huge demand surge happening in the supermarkets and the food and grocery stores, uh, but the shutdown in the non-essentials, immediately actually asked if the non-essential companies will like to volunteer their employees into the essential, especially in areas where they stay. And uh, immediately there was a 1500 num number of people who actually offered themselves saying, I'm willing to go and work. I'm from lifestyle or shoppers, but willing to go and work in Dmart or Big Bazaar or wherever. So actually this has happened and one of the global panels that I was in, I was told that in, in, in the Eurocommerce, they actually created something like this and they had almost a million employees on the exchange. So yes, we are right. And these are all methods to take it on. But <clears throat> there are two surveys that we have done. One in the retail where we expect the modern retail will have job losses about 20%. Nobody is saying it in front end because uh, there's a government mandate to say that you should not uh, have any job losses, but the reality is when there is no money, when you don't have monies to pay for salaries, there would be job losses, whether it is going to come in the front or not come in the front. And, and the second part is that uh, as we go forward, uh, there will be demand in some other sectors. So you're absolutely right. So I just want to move over to one other question. Uh, there are lots of questions which are coming in and one question is to say, uh, we don't have money to pay salaries. Uh, we are not supposed to do job losses. We want to keep our retailers happy, but we still have to cut costs. Okay, so under these constraints, how do we manage? So how do we, if you have any solutions coming from that the world, uh, keep your employees happy, don't cut costs, don't lose jobs, but still make things happen. Uh, okay, I don't know what are the inputs. Some of the inputs Radhika gave to say 50% of the time you're working, pay 50% salary, uh, shifts and things like that. Any, any thought around uh, uh, how do you keep employees happy during this situation? Yeah, okay. So, um, so the reality is, uh, if we look into the future a little, so for those brands, retailers that have opened their stores, they've reopened in China, they've been open for a, a month now, and on the whole, their revenues are um, 50 to 70 percent down where they were pre-COVID uh, lockdown. So, motor stores in the UK, so, some retailers and brands are looking at opening at the end of May. They're planning to be at 30 to 50% of revenue of where they were pre-COVID uh, uh, lockdown. 
Um, so, um, in order to keep employees happy, I mean, it's a $64 million question. So, in the UK, we are very lucky in that the government here have created a, and introduced a furloughing scheme, which means that they are underwriting 80% of salaries up to a certain amount um, up until the end of June. They've given, re retailing has been a hugely hit industry for some years. So now retailers have has a 12-month business rate holiday. So they're being given a lot of incentives in terms of taxation payments that are being delayed to keep many employees actually on the books so that when they open again, those employees will not be out of work. Of course, a lot of them will be made redundant. In the meantime, um, we do have some employees that are being deployed into the busier um, So Radik has mentioned online and of course um, food um, online sales hovered around 7% pre-lockdown. That's looking, that's gone to 14%. So some of them are being shifted to online functions. If you look at Europe, look at for instance Aldi which is a successful <coughs> large supermarket chain in Germany they on furloughed delivery drivers from McDonald's um, are not working so they suddenly hired them so that they can make more deliveries online it's a very worrying time for mo many people in retail and I think most leaders and HR directors are slowly coming up with incentives. Communication is key. Communication in terms of what that retailer and organisation is doing in terms of their business planning, people, people employed. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're not seeing too many uh, initiatives, um, but retailers and brands are working through. There are a couple of examples. Thank you. Uh, Harvind, I think maybe next time when you're answering, you may have to switch off your video because we are getting uh, disturbance in your voice and not able to hear you continuously. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Radhika, there's a lot of questions coming on uh, hiring process, uh, change in role of uh, various associates, both in the front end and back end. Uh, do you see that with this whole work from home using this new technology, uh, a full change in the way people are going to hire? and you actually represent a hiring agency and also do you think that uh, roles will evolve roles will change people have to start getting into multitasking and things like that yes um all of it in fact so um in fact one of the suggestions uh, uh, that i would uh, you know have i mean it, it, it seems logical is a lot of roles could actually be migrated to work from home i mean give up on real estate that could be the first saving i look at um, you know, retail is sitting on huge, huge uh, amounts of real estate. A lot of, um, you know, roles, certainly at corporate office level, could be shifted to, um, you know, could be shifted to work from home. And, uh, you know, people could come in as and when required. Um, otherwise, today, everything really is possible uh, online. And in fact, today, it was the, the, the ease with which, um, you know, work from home is, uh, is working out, uh, has been a revelation even to me and it's existed in my industry for a really long time. I mean, we've always had this as an option uh, in recruitment, for instance. But yes, um, work from home today is, is definitely, um, for a lot of the corporate office roles, is a definite possibility. Uh, for a lot of the support roles is a possibility. Uh, coming to the other part of your question, do I see a change in, uh, uh, in, in uh, some roles? Definitely. I think for starters, people will have to upskill. Um, and, and organizations need to upskill a lot of their associates so that they are able to multitask. Say, for instance, there's, there'll be a lot of uh, diverting of uh, consumer traffic from offline to online because that really is uh, where I see business happening going forward. And if that is happening, uh, a lot of your offline resources today, a lot of the associates who manage offline business need to be trained on how efficiently they should migrate traffic onto online and how they, they could uh, you know, manage the entire e-commerce part of the business. Um, again, uh, e-commerce is something which not all um, retail companies have invested in. 
today, you know, things like Bopus, etc., are here to stay. I mean, you buy online and you pick up in the store. So can you create, um, uh, you know, uh, areas and ways in which, um, you know, picking up in store is possible without waiting, uh, you know, for people, uh, you know, order online and come and pick up in the store and move on. Is that possible? Uh, maybe functions like merchandising, etc., could be, you know, could be upscale. Merchandisers, their, their own focus could be, you know, changed or upscaling could happen so that they're able to take on a new reality, which is online. Um, so, so I think today that uh, the, the emergence or the acceptance of e-commerce, that, 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 that's not, that can't be questioned. Today, e-commerce is here to stay. Omnichannel is the way forward. And really, physical retailing has to give way to um, online retailing. And making that transition is going to require some amount of upscaling of associates. And that could be one way in which you could keep associates relevant and engaged and employed, most important, um, within organizations. So that is something that, that, that uh, needs to happen. Yeah, um, in, fact, in fact, very, very interesting thought, Radhika. Uh, today, when we are all sitting at home as retailers, we actually have to think through saying, how can we serve our customers irrespective of what we do, whether we are offline, online, brick and mortar, e-commerce. The question is, if the customer is shopping 24 by 7, we need to be available to them 24 by 7. This is the right time to actually think through. We also have to think through saying, <clears throat> if an offline retailer has to serve a customer, can their employees do assisted shopping, at least with those customers who are not probably on the higher end of the curve of digital shopping, okay, and where the experience can still happen maybe at home. So, so there has to be new ways of evolving the business and there's no doubt, there is no doubt, doubt about that. Uh, Rajiv, uh, since yours is a touch and feel business and you have seen a lot of business, you have been in hypermarkets, supermarkets, department store retailing. Uh, tell me, can you imagine a new world uh, which is likely to happen where your associates on the front end can do a different kind of a service and people in the head office can also start doing revenue generating business because in retail, the revenue generation happens on the front end and most of the costs are at the corporate office. Okay. Correct. So can we ask a HR person or a merchandiser, you know, or an admin person to say, guy, can you also bring in some money into the business? Yeah, I think uh, everything is a no holds bar right now because I think everybody is rethinking, reinventing people and networking, you know, the smallest to small essentials that we sell today. Like, for example, in our case, something like a sanitizer, every soul in the back office is today finding avenues and options to sell it because that's the only product that can be sold today. But I feel uh, already this world has come much before COVID. I think we may have uh, taken a little, of, little bit of time to realize this change. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, companies like Homa, companies like uh, in China and companies like Amazon have already done that kind of a physical online offline merging of stores where the number of retail associates needed in stores to serve are lesser. They are also fulfilling online orders as they are fulfilling offline orders. The physical touch and feel of customer with customer service associates is actually reducing, but the overall experience in the stores is still uh, still spectacular. The, the merging of, of online technologies with offline has been there for some time. But I think what happens is retailers being traditional in mindset sometimes take a little bit extra time to say, let that happen with the online players and we'll come in a little later. But I think this COVID revolution uh, or change that has come in uh, will push a lot of people towards that direction. I would say all progressive retailers have been planning for this world for the last two to three years. COVID just happened to be a and I would say will happen to be a catalyst. But I think digital transformation is something that everybody has been really trying. The online, offline merging, all the examples that Radhika mentioned of, you know, uh, contactless delivery, all of these kind of things people are actually looking at. Just a small example I'll give you. In the last one, I mean, last one month, we've been sitting and saying the fact that in our kind of a contact business, it's going to take another five to six months time before the customer is going to be comfortable coming to a clinic and taking services. Now, typically, we work with almost 140 doctors in our company who are absolutely technology. Uh, uh, they, they, they really do not absorb technology as easily as quite a few other areas. And, and it's been very difficult to actually uh, make technological change with respect to doctor-led consulting. But in the last one month, they have taken to web consulting like fish in water. You know, they actually completely moved their thinking from saying the fact that that's my only way of talking to a consumer is physical 
to actually saying the fact that okay, this is the best thing that has happened to us. I have spoken to at least about eighty doctors in the last two weeks, and all of them have actually said this um, example is great. We also got connects and contacts with companies like Swiggy and Zomato. food delivery partners who are saying the fact that if you are willing to create your clinics as delivery points or centers we are willing to deliver your goods to customers so a lot of companies dominos has done it they are supplying sapola uh, you know swiggy zomato has a service called genie so a lot of things are there so i would say collaboration is another big part of online and offline because all online players bring a specific skill set that offline players will not completely be able to morph in very quickly so i think if you collaborate very well with online players there is a benefit i'll give you an example we are also talking to companies like medlife for example when the doctor gives a prescription today to a consumer how that prescription could be loaded to a company like uh, medlife and then supplied the prescription being supplied to the consumer without a physical contact with the customer into the clinic so i think there are great ideas there are great opportunities there are great opportunities for collaboration but the online offline world has to work together i i don't think it can work in competition alone that's my thought rajiv in the earlier one of the webinars the word that kept going on and on was communication 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 yes and in this case it was mostly saying communicate with your employees don't leave them high and dry yes. don't leave them to imagination of what will happen so i am picking up the thread from there and now saying that it it is also collaboration yes. because it is impossible for you to develop all the competencies and skill sets and you may have to pick some of the competencies from maybe somebody else so yes. what they are competitors and yes. and at least if you collaborate you'll be able to bring down the cost so as you were talking radhika was talking harvin i was just thinking what if you are able to make our employees as entrepreneurs through digital technology what if our our employees during the day time are are in the physical store but when they are not on the store uh, i mean their tab becomes their way of selling and then in the 24 hours if they are contacting customers or doing some sale through the online portion of your company they are getting commission on that which means that they have more revenues to earn more anyway in india we don't mind working 12 hours and things like that unlike a french okay so we are <laughs> working so is there is there a way we can actually bring in entrepreneurship and can the organizations have an open mind can the policies and rules of hr be changed you know where the rigidity of things can go on and become quite fluid i think harvin this is the question i'm throwing to you is more of a deliberation that how do we make things flexible less rules but bring in more collaboration whether it is between retailers organizations or employees as entrepreneurs your thoughts please so again no i'll i'll go to harvin then and come to you radhika yeah okay please. okay so um i agree with everything that's been said collaboration is a holistic of um and uh having uh, a holistic skill sets so as retailing has grown up many leaders have come from silo functions and entity ceos um with the emergence and growth obviously of digital and here in the uk it's sitting at around 22 25% and will grow more than that um the end to end customer experience journey is something that all retailers are focusing on trying to work out what they need to do with their teams in order to make them uh, most effective it you know the answer is it depends if the organization is a tanker it's not agile it doesn't move quickly if the has been a command and control leadership in place then trying to change that culture to encourage your employees to move and work in an agile manner as entrepreneurs is going to be quite a journey and take some time i think we would normally see that move faster in smaller organizations um but it's going to be very interesting as organizations become more lean uh, there is a mindset for multitasking uh, we're not seeing that happen quite yet but it'll be an interesting journey yeah radhika you wanted to say something on this subject please go ahead yeah 
So, you know, there are four points which come to mind and I'm just going to I put these down just so they don't go out of my head and I'm going to collate all of them at the end. So um, just basis, a lot of uh, uh, discussions I've had and reading up on this, uh, you know, in the, in the press, etc. four points which immediately came to mind. One is, I think all organizations are going to today relook at every role within the organization, whether at a senior level or right down to a, the junior most associate. And every role needs to add value. And when I say value, it means, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, what is the contribution to the company revenues? So every role needs to be a value creating uh, role. And that's the only way uh, that role continues to stay relevant in an organization. So, th so that's one reality. That's the post-COVID world. Every organization is going to do that. Second is in the post-COVID world, we're going to see an increase in localization. That's mm -hmm. the other thing. I think we're all going to be producing local and consuming local. Um, uh, and, and that's where we're all going to shift. So I don't think there's going to be too much of, uh, um, uh, you know, importing from overseas. It's, it's going to be the rise of small manufacturers, small entrepreneurs who are going to, uh, you know, produce uh, locally and will service the local um, ecosystem, uh, you know, local uh, uh, consumer base in their area. So localization is a second, uh, is a second reality. The third um, observation here, and again, it's related uh, to localization is, um, you know, uh, one of the things that I observed during this uh, uh, lockdown crisis is you have large grocery chains like DMART, for instance, which have actually brought many, uh, uh, you know, grocery stores and set them up in localities. And they're servicing, um, so these are places where they didn't originally have stores, but they've come into large residential societies or housing societies, and they've set up small grocery stores. And again, uh, you know, the stores which have actually come to our rescue is, like you said, the local Kirana stores. They are the ones who've actually come to the rescue and have ensured that our kitchens continue to run and, you know, stay functional. So that is the third observation. And the, and the fourth, which is again related to the localization piece, is the increase in, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I foresee an increase in uh, the number of small entrepreneurs in the post-COVID world. Mm -hmm. now, if I was to just collate all of these points, then exactly what you said makes a lot of sense. I think it's time organizations look at their associates beyond the roles that they, uh, you know, that they uh, uh, carry out in the organization itself and look at how um, uh, these resources can be additionally deployed to bring in revenues. Even if, uh, you know, within the organization, they're all in, not in revenue generating roles, they could still be, they'll still go out and generate revenues. So, um, uh, for instance, um, I mean, this is just an example from the top of my head. Say uh, you have uh, somebody working for a shopper stop and uh, they manage clothes. Why not look at, uh, you know, uh, picking up orders from your neighborhood or your locality and then, uh, uh, you know, servicing those and getting, uh, getting those service back in and delivered uh, to the customers directly. So orders can be generated uh, locally. You could have somebody, uh, you could have uh, associates in shopper stop, each of whom, outside of the shop could be used to generate orders. They could pick up orders from friends, relatives, neighbors, and uh, you know, those could be serviced from the back end. It's, it's one way of, uh, of, of uh, them earning commissions, additional revenues, additional res uh, revenues for the organization and commissions for themselves. This looks very, very possible Radhika because I was looking at the chats and I must say hats off to a lot of entrepreneurs. So on the chats, there are not only questions, there is a lawyer who has said, I'm a lawyer and I, I have worked in many companies in many countries and I'm willing to offer my services. So he's selling his legal services. There's an e-commerce player who's saying, any of you want, I can actually make you online in 24 hours. So this has almost become a market, marketplace, Ajay. People are selling their, <laughs> selling their ways there. And I don't know what we are trying to sell here. Yeah, but <clears throat> tell me, Radhika, I, this question is specifically to you because you will also do very high level hiring. Yeah. What is currently going on in the minds of CEOs in retail when they have to look at so many pressures from all over the mind? And right. secondly, those senior people who are sitting here, how should they think in such calamities? Because with my 40 years in retail, I have not seen anything like this. So I don't know how many of us have actually had ever, ever looked at a shutdown. In all of our risk, we have always worked for a slowdown. But shutdown, this is the first time. So get into the brain of a CEO and talk to us. Okay, so I think uh, both CEOs have got, gotten over the first hurdle, which is complete disbelief. It's like, how can I shut down? So I think the, the disbelief hurdle they've crossed. 
the second hurdle I think they crossed was uh, how do I ensure my business survives? So, you know, next quarter, next half year, this financial year. And, and let's not forget this hit us in the middle of March, which is it hit us in the middle of the financial year closing. So I think that was the second big uh, worry they all had. So once I think those couple of hurdles they crossed, I think um, uh, today if I was to look at, uh, you know, what most CEOs are thinking, two or three things. One is how do you ensure that the business survives? That's the, that's the fundamental question. And how do you ensure that the business survives with uh, the least number of casualties? Because, um, you know, there, there will be casualties, there will be layoffs, there will be job losses. And uh, uh, while most CEOs are geared to think in terms of revenues and numbers, I think this particular crisis, if I was to compare it with say 2008, which was also a huge crisis and it hit a lot of businesses at that time. This crisis is different because it, 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 there's a very strong human element to this crisis. And I think you can't take that away. So most CEOs today are looking at how do you ensure that the business survives, but how do you ensure it happens with the least number of casualties? So, uh, you know, the, the comments that we're seeing really is a reflection of uh, a larger thinking, which is today there is a need for collaboration. There is a need for transparency and there's a need for businesses to work together collaboratively. So you can't work with individual businesses and look at each other as competitors. You really need to work as a community and see how as an industry retail will survive. And if as an industry... Yeah. So I, I, have, I have a question which I think has been coming here again. Uh, you have only so much of money. You have an option to let go some people on the job. You have an option to cut salaries so that most people can stay back. So you are able to manage many more families than letting go some. But on the other hand, 2008-9, when you actually did this cutting of salaries and kept everybody, the moment things became all right, the first people who actually flew off the ship were the best talents because they thought that they got crushed with the others. So you actually lost a lot of talent. So the question to all three of you, and maybe Harvin, you can answer if you can, to say what should be the option of the HR head or CEO? Cut compensation, retain many, let people go. This is not UK, Harvin, where furloughs and government is supported as of today, government has not said a word. Yeah. So give us some, some clue as to how the HR head should manage situations with the kitty that they have and so many people that they have on the roles. I think it will all come down to now um, where CEOs are now. They've got over the shock, they've got their balance sheets, they've extended their debt facilities. So now, they're thinking about, okay, for us to survive and thrive, do we have a purpose? How do we accentuate that purpose? What is authenticity? What happens, in, particularly in Europe, if, um, as some pundits say, that the desire from consumers will be very hit? You know, we've been materialistic, but hey, I can only wear one shirt at a time. I don't need 50 that are just sitting in my wardrobe. If that consumer is going to change um, and really be driven by uh, purpose, sustainability, uh, being a more careful and conscious consumer, then I think that that will go hand in hand with obviously that CEO refining, building their, their business model their operating model, and they will then make, they will make um, decisions. Even with furlough, this is just a temporary band-aid. We are expecting many redundancies as we come out of furlough in June. Um, it's difficult to say at what levels they will um, make redundancies. Clearly, bricks and mortar stores will be hit. There'll be fewer of those more will close, those that remain will be re the real flagship sto showstoppers. Um, and um, as Radhika has pointed out, obviously online is going to continue to grow, that end-to-end -end customer experience, how you integrate with other retailers, click and collect, curbside delivery, delivering safely to home. There will, these will be new and pragmatic measures that are extended from that digital um, e-commerce model. So one of, the, one of the thoughts that has come into my mind and I've been speaking to people is, 
that please utilize this time to imagine what the business will look like in the future. And both from technology point of view, change in consumer behavior, change in environment and change in the legal framework. Okay, you, your business may not be the same business. And if the business is shifting 25%, 30%, then a lot of roles may not be needed for the future. At least for those roles, you have to be fair and honest to the employee to say these roles are not required from tomorrow. And those are the roles to be the furloughed or those are the roles which have to go out. And then the balanced roles actually then can be monitored with the amount of cash that you have. I think that's one of the options because many a times due to emotional reasons, a lot of retailers and CEOs would not want to say, hey guys, we will let you go. This let you go is not an Indian culture. You know, it, it, it also has all this saying, what will society say? What will neighborhood say? And sometimes they say, Agar kiya to se paap lagega. you know, so all this is there in our minds. So I, I think we will have to really live live with this kind of a thinking. Uh, I just want to move away because a lot of questions are coming, which are very, very specific questions, Rajiv, uh, yeah. which, are, which are in terms of business models, uh, which are in terms of saying uh, uh, what will happen to restaurants, what will happen to service organizations. So it is outside the topic, but maybe if you want to just comment, Rajiv Singh, what you have learned and seen, uh, what is the likelihood of... Uh, uh, we know that the opening will happen in a month or two and things will prolong for six to nine months. Any thoughts that you would like to yeah. give to our entrepreneurs? Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, add a different dimension to this because, you know, we work with doctors, okay? And, uh, and doctors have a strong point of view on, on how this virus spreads and what really happens. So we started getting information about the subject as early as January. And probably the fear factor and anxiety in our business is probably higher than any other business because the people who are dealing with clients really understood the risk that they were running at the same time the consumers were actually running coming into the clinics. So I think while uh, we are all optimistic of the fact that you know within the next one or, we, one, one or two weeks something or the other will keep opening and relaxing, I think the social distancing norms for businesses will become very, very stringent. And we expect at least for the next three to four or five months Actually, the, the, the business is to work suboptimal, planned suboptimal because, you know, there was a comment that one of the mall operators said recently saying, this is the first time in my life I'm consciously trying to find ways and means to reduce the number of clients coming to my mall because that will be the need of the hour because we also do not want to be responsible for spreading this virus further. And at the same time, you have to be mindful of the millions of employees who are working with us because lack of understanding and knowledge on the subject should not lead us to a much bigger crisis that we cannot handle in future. So my only submission is let businesses open, let businesses open carefully. But I think a lot of stringent norms are needed for the next six months time till we have a safe option for exit uh, from this virus. For example, a, a vaccine comes in, faster testing comes in and stuff like that put together. So I think, uh, you know, uh, we are all in an anxiety to see how business wants. Every employee in retail wants to come back to work. Okay. Every government wants to st start off the economy because, you know, the economy has really taken a big hit over the last two months time. But I think the, the challenge in front of us is way more serious. Uh, the kind of norms that we are talking about, the kind of solutions that we need actually will be quite detrimental to business in the next three to six months time. The only other ways, are there other alternatives to reach our products to our consumer? And can we collaborate? Again, I'm going back to the word collaboration to say the fact that food, rather than opening up restaurants all, all in sundry, find ways and means to get your best food to the consumer at the best price without actually having to have physical contact. Apparel retailers, the lesser and lesser number of people inside the stores, lesser trials, uh, or absolutely no trials, maybe almost acting like an online store where a person can go and have a very, very liberal exchange policy, which will be there cashless, uh, uh, you know, ca ca uh, what do you call it, without a cashiering in a hypermarket model where only uh, digital payments are allowed for some time. So those kind of solutions, a lot of solutions have been discussed. But what I'm saying is this, 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 this fear or this factor is not going to go away for the next three to six months. Time. So before, before I, I ask for a closing comment, uh, you always have uh, people who are big optimists and there's, there's an optimist in the in the chat box who says that, you know, Y2K happened, everything came back. 2008-9 happened, everything came back and everything will actually come back. So for people like that, hats off. I mean, it'd be nice to have optimists. Sure. The only thing I want to bring on the table is 
that in all those the environment and the rules of the game didn't change okay and since this is a retail panel i want to just share with you as to uh, taking an example as to how the rules of the game are getting changed okay if you look at a restaurant or if you look at a multiplex or you look at a mall firstly the malls are likely to operate 8 hours instead of 12 hours so one third of the possibility of real estate space being utilized is gone second is once they come in we will have to have social distancing which means in a theater maybe only one out of yeah. three seats in a restaurant the four of you cannot sit around one table the four of you have to sit six feet away okay which is worse than having a dining experience at home on the other hand only 50 percent of the employees can come into your place for the next few months or whatever that means the service level comes down by 50 percent so you are a brick and mortar store with these restrictions, you still have to deliver the experience for which the customer is coming. Because if the experience factor is not there, why the hell should a customer come to you? She can shop from home and do an online shopping. So I think these are some of the new, uh, new rules which are getting set up. Some things that we know. We don't know what are the new rules the customer will set up. Yeah, for example, yesterday we were talking, saying that if, if mask is going to become the way of life, would women buy lipsticks? Okay, and will they do facial makeups? Okay, because then you don't require that at all. Yeah, so look at what are the things that are happening. If work from home is the way forward, then will men buy pants at all? Yeah, because <laughs> you could be sitting in your lungi or a dhoti or a short and just wear the top. So the bottom wear industry will go for a toss. It will be only the top wear industry. Yeah, so there, there are these new rules which are getting set. The only thing is that people have to be conscious, keep your eyes and ears open. Please keep track of your customers, understand their changing habits, look at collaborating with your partners, with people on the same street, maybe they are competitors, maybe they are complementing uh, retailers. Uh, and don't forget that you need to communicate with your uh, employees again and again because they are your ambassadors whom you will require today, tomorrow, or day after. Yeah? With that, probably I'll pass it on to each one of you to give your closing comments. We have three minutes, so maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, starting with you, Harvin. Uh, okay. Um, to your point, uh, I think ultimately um, we're human beings and it's great having a fantastic online experience and getting that product shipped quickly, efficiently, at a great price. But at the end of the day, and there may well be fewer of them, into a store and you're given a, an experience that absolutely delights you that's that's what you're going to remember you're not going to remember a delivery coming through from amazon that got to you within 24 hours so um i think that there will always be a, uh, a, a an opportunity for human contact and the world's going to look different but we are going to get through it yeah yeah, Rajiv, then Radhika. Yeah, I think uh, what I mean, well said by Harveen, actually. I think uh, that physical touch, feel, the emotional aspect of, of retail will not go away. Uh, people will come back. It may take a little time, but I think we'll get through with it. I think that's important. But I think as leaders of businesses today, what is needed is some level of empathy. While we understand that there is a lot of things crashing all around us, but we start falling apart. I think our businesses will not survive. So I think a lot of listening, a lot of engagement, a lot of discussion with people constantly. So even if something bad happens, there is constant communication, which means the fact that the organization cares is something that we should not leave. And, uh, and uh, this should be done at every level in the organization. The, the absolute people connect is absolutely mandatory right now at this, uh, this difficult phase. Radhika? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, as with um, every crisis, obviously, while we're battling the crisis, there is always an opportunity. And I think this is probably an opportunity for the retail industry to take a good hard look at the way forward and reboot. So it, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to reboot. Exactly as Rajiv said, I think um, uh, retail will not lose, um, you know, retail will need to stay and in fact grow and become more meaningful, more experiential. The whole uh, customer experience part of retail needs to continue. At the same time, when businesses do a reboot, they need to do it keeping their people uh, you know, at the center of everything. And while some roles will, yes, become redundant as, uh, you know, as an end result of this reboot, if you're saying businesses will, will change and retail will look different, 
well, then some roles will become redundant. And I think then that's an opportunity to see either how you can upskill and redeploy those redundant uh, resources or offer them up to others who are hiring. And that's where, you know, I think associations like RAI or ASCII can come into play. Say we have these resources, they're great talent, they're great resources available and, you know, offer them up to sectors or, uh, you know, industries that are hiring. And there are a whole bunch of related uh, sectors that will be doing hiring as, a, you know, post-COVID. And these resources will be available for them. I think that should be a good way forward. So I, I just had one, one somebody who put on the chat that this will actually lead to many more delivery boys and girls required because if most people are going to stay at home, then everything has to get delivered to house. So, so I'm just going to close this comment with saying, just imagine yeah, retail has 46 million people working. If you have 46 million people who are delivering on the road with their mobiles, what's likely to happen on the roads? Yeah, you, I just leave it to your imagination. Ajay, before I hand it over back to you, there are a lot of questions which are left unanswered. They were not related directly. But in case if you have some other questions which you would like to pass to any of the panelists, and if the panelists want to answer, they can answer it back and give it to you for further transmission so that the customers on this webinar don't feel as if they have their questions have got neglected. Over to you, Ajay. And thank you very much, all the panelists. Thank you. And thank you, audience. Thank you. For, for thank you. Thank for you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Nagesh. Yes, uh, we generally send all the questions back, to, which are unanswered, back to the panelists for their answers. And then we add those answers to our own entrepreneurial notes to be sent to all the, pan all the participants. And we'll do that. And thank you very much for everybody to take off your time. And uh, Mr. Nagesh, it was wonderful, uh, you always. And uh, Harveen, thank you for, for being with us from, from so far and so early in the morning. My Radhika, pleasure. It was wonderful for you. And Ajib, uh, thanks for new perspective altogether, especially from a format like yours. Thank you very much and take thank care you all of you. And thanks for all participants to be part of it. Thank you. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you worked very hard on the panel, so not 10 miles, but 11 miles today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you then. Thanks everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Bye.